Kathy, very much. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Well, welcome everybody who's here in, in KEI um, and also joining us uh, virtually. As Kathy alluded to, this has really been about five months in the making. Um, so it's wonderful always to see all of that background effort come together uh, actually on the day of the event. Um, and I want to just uh, single out my KEI colleague, Andy Hong, who's been my wingman in, in putting this all together. Uh, and his, uh, his efforts been uh, fantastic uh, and essential to putting this on, as well as all my other KEI colleagues who have helped put this on and are currently helping run it. Um, I just wanted to give a few brief housekeeping notes on, on just the run of show uh, of the event for people's awareness. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, we'll have three panels and they'll all follow the same uh, sort of format. Uh, for the first part, all the panelists will give takeaways from the papers that they've written. We'll then turn to a moderated Q&A with, with our moderators uh, for about 15 minutes, and then turn to you, the audience, for questions uh, that you may have uh, about uh, the papers that we present, as well as to those online. Uh, and in that vein, if you're here in the audience, just old-fashioned, raise your hand, and we will bring a mic to you. If you're online, please put your questions in the chat function, and we will turn to those as well. Um, when it comes to the lunch break, excuse me, we'll move directly from the first panel into the second panel. And then after the second panel, we'll break for lunch at 11.50. We want people to mingle, eat, you know, sort of uh, check out the rest of our newly remodeled office. And then we will reconvene, at least for those who want to potentially pose questions to Dr. Hecker uh, in this room quarter past 12. Um, but if you want to keep eating and mingling, we will have his remarks on the TVs out there as well. Uh, and finally, um, we have uh, sequentially published the papers over the last six weeks or so on our website, but we have also digitally compiled them, and they are available. We'll put a link online right now for those uh, who want to download that PDF. And for those uh, in-house, QR code is not for your lunch order. It is for the aforementioned uh, report. So if you want to aim your phone at it, you can access it there as well. So please share widely. Um, and uh, I think that's enough out of me. I'll pass things over to Mr. Richard Lawless, who we're very pleased to have joining us. Well, thank you, Clint. Uh, very much appreciate Kathy's opening remarks. Uh, pleasure to be here, and I uh, thank you for creating this wonderful forum to have this important discussion. I will lead by saying that uh, I'm also a beneficiary of Clint's work on his PhD thesis. I think it's one of the most detailed and uh, some and prescriptive for sure assessments of the entire run of the US ROK Alliance. And I would recommend to anybody, if you haven't read Clint's paper, to do so because it uh, is quite an accomplishment. So I want to mention that first, Clinton. Thank you. Um, secondly, um, I know that we have, uh, I'm very mindful of my moderator duties and keeping everybody in the cage, if you will, in terms of uh, the amount of time that they get to spend on what they're presenting. But I want to mention that we have Paul um, Che from uh, RAND that will make his presentation, certainly, on um, a very interesting topic on the mechanisms for strengthening deterrence, among others, on the Alliance. And that's a very compelling issue, um, and um, it's an ongoing process, but I know that um, Paul's comments are going to be of great interest. Um, I believe that um, Andy Hong's presentation on, again, deterrence capabilities and, and how these are evolving are very important as well. And uh, certainly not last but least, uh, the comments that will be made by um, my next-door neighbor here, Tay Wa. And I think that's going to put some additional aspects of this um, into perspective. So the whole idea here is that each of the presenters will spend about 10 minutes making their points. Uh, at the end of that collective session, we'll have, uh, I'll ask a couple of questions and use up a little bit of time. But uh, obviously, the capstone of all this is for you folks to participate and direct questions at them to round out the session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Clint to make his presentation. Thank you, Richard. Um, and we're, I think most people are aware, but um, Richard himself embodies in his experience uh, and in the history that he's recently written as well, uh, a lot of what we'll be discussing today. So we're fortunate to have him, and it's also daunting to have him as our moderator. Um, 
so in my piece, um, I, I attempt to explore certain tensions, certain historical tensions and contradictions in the U.S. commitment to South Korea and how they've affected very complicated processes of extended deterrence and allied reassurance, which of course have become even more complicated in the post-Cold War era uh, and within a democratized South Korea. And I think help, help us better understand how the alliance got to where it is today and some of the increased uh, discourse on South Korea's nuclear armament. Uh, throughout the Korean War, uh, the U.S. considered and threatened nuclear use, uh, yet these threats belied what I see as a really inherent tension in Washington's uh, commitment to Korea, namely that it was not important enough to further expand the war on or beyond the peninsula, but far too important to simply uh, relinquish. And I think this tension remains even today, despite South Korea's remarkable transformation and enhanced intrinsic value. Following the signing of the Korean War Armistice Agreement <coughs> and to signal U.S. commitment, Washington agreed to, of course, a mutual defense treaty with South Korea and the forward uh, deployment of U.S. troops, and soon thereafter began considering the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons, which it first deployed in January of 1958, and by the mid to late 60s had deployed about eight different types and nearly 1,000 warheads. Uh, and this decision to deploy tactical nuclear weapons and advanced conventional weapons at that time was driven by several factors. Uh, one, to prevent alliance forces from being overrun early uh, in a conflict. Uh, second, to quote, modernize U.S. and ROC forces, but also to set parameters to South Korea's own capabilities and agency. And third, as part of a broader global strategy, to incorporate nuclear weapons in U.S. military forces. So four years after forward deployment of theater nuclear weapons to Europe, uh, the concurrent deployment of tactical nuclear weapons to Taiwan, Korea, and elsewhere in East Asia was part of this broader sort of techno-bureaucratic momentum. Uh, however, as I see it, it, it applied a catch-all formula, which alongside a monolithic conception of communism at the time, conflated distinct local threats in ways that, that veiled problematic contradictions just beneath the surface. And so forward deployment of large, large numbers of tactical nuclear weapons implied deterrence failure on a grand scale, which of course uh, was meant to reinforce deterrence. However, it also starkly limited options, which I think became particularly apparent when successive U.S. administrations either attempted to reduce and realign their forces or in the wake of North Korean provocations. So for example, in 1989, excuse me, 1968 and 1969, uh, the Johnson and Nixon administrations, respectively, in response to the Pueblo incident and the EC-121 shootdown, uh, faced a polarized spectrum uh, of response options, uh, from a minimum conventional response, which is, of course, what they opted for, and a maximum threat of nuclear use. However, to, agree, to a degree, both of these response options lacked credibility. The former risked further provocations and angered Seoul, which expected a more robust response, thus potentially spurring its own effort to seek strategic autonomy from Washington. And the latter, namely the threat of nuclear use, was so disproportionate that it was sort of unbelievable, politically costly, of dubious military utility, and I think most critically it went against the ROK's own desire to avoid nuclear use on the Korean Peninsula. Ironically though, it was these same events that would spur U.S. efforts to further reduce, realign, and make more flexible its force posture on the peninsula which in turn sparked ROK doubts about the U.S. commitment, and of course Seoul's own hedging through, for example, its own clandestine nuclear weapons program, which will be explored by some of my fellow panelists. So Washington curtailed Seoul's effort by promising, among, among other strong countermeasures, by promising to maintain troop levels, but also through the first ever public acknowledgement of tactical nuclear weapons in South Korea in 1975, and the refusal to rule out first use. And this dynamic became even more pronounced under President Jimmy Carter's abortive troop withdrawal policy in the late 1970s, during which the Pentagon began to openly speak about theater nuclear weapons as the symbolic link between forward deployed troops and larger U.S. Uh, strategic forces. And it was also at that time that Washington began to insert the, the language on the nuclear umbrella into the annual security consultative meetings joint uh, communiques, which of course is a practice that's maintained ever since. So simply put, the more Washington reduced and realigned its force posture, the more it openly cast its nuclear shadow. Of course, it was also at this time that the alliance established the Bilateral Combined Forces Command, or CFC, which was a, a much more integrated defense arrangement within which South Korea took on a more robust role 
However, however, none of these very notable changes obviated the tension at the core of the U.S. commitment, nor the polarized and limited options it had vis-a-vis -vis a highly risk acceptant North Korea. And furthermore, that tighter alliance integration within the CFC explicitly excluded consultation on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. It was also during the same period that the U.S. began to significantly reduce its theater nuclear weapons both in, in Korea and the region. And this was due in part to a major security review, but also greater scrutiny about the escalatory risks of these weapons. Now, of course, these risks had been there all along. Uh, and many people cite them today as a reason not to reintroduce tactical nuclear weapons to the peninsula. But what had changed in the late 1980s was the political and strategic context. The waning of the Cold War led to George H. W. Bush's nuclear, uh, nuclear security initiative in September of 1991 and the unilateral removal of all theater nuclear weapons except from a handful of NATO allies. Uh, just like their introduction to the peninsula in 1958, uh, the removal of tactical nukes was largely driven by broader geopolitical imperatives, uh, but also the need to persuade Pyongyang to accept international inspections of its fledgling nuclear program, and also because South Korea's defense the, at the time was no longer seen, these were no longer seen as necessary to South Korea's defense. Uh, however, a key condition at the time to reassure Seoul and to enhance extended deterrence was continued reaffirmation of the, uh, the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Following the Cold War, deterring North Korea as it advanced its nuclear missile capabilities, of course, has become a far more complex process. Uh, for one, U.S. nuclear posturing and signals have been inconsistent and at times highly provocative. And while partially effective at the upper strategic level, they've lacked credibility below that threshold. So as I discussed during the Cold War, North Korea was perfectly willing to test the alliance in that space. Now that it possesses its own nuclear deterrent, it appears far more emboldened to do so. Critically, deterrent signals are also meant, of course, to reassure Seoul. Yet Seoul's economic growth and enhanced capabilities, which will also be discussed on this panel, while the basis for a stronger alliance, have also significantly complicated allied reassurance. Given further reductions in realignments in U.S. forces since the end of the Cold War, the ROK's steadily advancing conventional capabilities have become more central to the alliance's own deterrence and warfighting equation. But as a result of that, Seoul, of course, has paid, placed greater scrutiny on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Furthermore, South Korea's democratization, while it's also deepened alliance ties, has complicated that same uh, reassurance process. Of course, during the Cold War, alliance management and reassurance, it wasn't a simple process, but it was channeled through a much more centralized dictatorial ROK government. Nowadays, civil society, public opinion are much more prominent factors in alliance management. And uh, new generations of ROK leaders with different views on the alliance and inter-Korean relations have entered the decision-making fray. So on the one hand, progressive ROK administrations pursue a theory of deterrence that's premised on restraint and a more compatriotic view of inter-Korean relations. And for them, they often seek greater autonomy both in and outside of the alliance. And they often see U.S. extended deterrent signals as too much. On the other hand, conservative administrations operate with a theory of deterrence that emphasizes readiness and a preparedness to retaliate against North Korean provocations. They often see U.S. deterrence policy and signals as not enough. Both progressives and conservatives seek greater input in alliance and, and U.S. planning, but I think for different reasons. And so as a result of this, reassurance gets tangled as different ROK administrations react differently to U.S. extended deterrence policy, which again is itself inconsistent, and adopt ever-shifting policy trajectories. So these complex dynamics have played out in the alliance's consultative mechanisms, which have emerged and evolved over the last two decades, which Paul will be talking about in more detail. Uh, these mechanisms do represent a very genuine effort to develop a more holistic approach to deterring North Korea's evolving threat However, due to the aforementioned dynamics, the Allies have brought different understandings to these mechanisms. And so while there appears policy consensus, there are very real perceptual and operational gaps beneath that. So in closing, if polarized deterrence options were a problem for the U.S. and the Alliance during the Cold War, it's even more so today, and it places even greater stress on South Korea, which again already bears the overwhelming conventional deterrence uh, responsibility for the alliance. So tightening alliance cooperation along the conventional nuclear threshold is critical to enhancing reassurance and reducing the appeal for Seoul of its own nuclear deterrent, but also signaling to Pyongyang uh, 
that its, its own advancing capabilities do not afford it the luxury to coerce either beneath or up to the nuclear level. I do think the Biden and the administrations uh, have redoubled efforts to tighten their cooperation where U.S. capabilities end, rock capabilities begin, and most importantly, where the two intertwine. However, I think for this to be effective, to be more effective, uh, this really demands that Washington show greater fidelity to South Korea's need for more involvement in U.S. nuclear policy and planning, more than historically it's been comfortable with. But also, on the other hand, for Seoul to understand the limits of such cooperation do not reflect necessarily a lack of U.S. commitment. And the last thing I'll say um, is an observation that I think is so obvious that it sometimes goes left unsaid, which is the fact that South Korea has never independently navigated its national security without a U.S. force presence, except for one year, June of, June of 1949 to the outbreak of the Korean War. And but for the return of U.S. forces, it likely would have been swallowed whole and destroyed. So I think this, this cuts deep psychological grooves and, and results in insecurities that are wholly understandable. And I think, why do I say this? I say this because today we find ourselves with an urgent and advancing North Korean threat, a very unstable, broader strategic environment, but also a South Korea that's more capable than it's ever been. And so I see the alliance, that the, the institutional underpinnings of the alliance are facing tensions now that they did in the 70s, but, but they are anew these days. This doesn't mean it's going to become unbound. It means serious work needs to be put into what are problems with existing institutional arrangements, how might they be updated. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, which is not the most positive note, is this all happens in a political context. And there are political forces in our own country here um, that existed under the previous administration and could, could return again, which cast significant doubt about U.S commitment and credibility. So no matter what the Biden and the administration do, democracies fortunately, but sometimes unfortunately, have electoral turnover. And that changes context. And so uh, I've said too much, so I'll close with that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm here to, to join the panel and provide uh, context, historical context, that shapes the discourse of rock nuclear armament. And I do this by examining how the alliance established and evolved its nuclear deterrence-focused consultative mechanism and posture. My study, therefore, takes stock of where progress has been made, but also identifies where progress has been limited. And I find that through various consultative mechanisms, the alliance has realized, one, a more combined, comprehensive, and holistic deterrence posture, but that, two, this generally involved greater integration of ROC advanced conventional means, ROC and U.S. non-nuclear capabilities, and more non-military activities. Ultimately, the context I offer is this. While the alliance has adapted in critical ways to changes in the North Korean threat, thereby strengthening deterrence and providing reassurance, an enduring challenge remains in the conspicuous lack of progress to integrate South Korea in U.S. nuclear operations. Now let me provide you highlights in the alliance's evolution that is the basis of my assessment. It is important to first note the context that led to official rock us dialogue on U.S. extended nuclear deterrence, which only began in 2010 through the establishment of the Extended Deterrence Policy Committee, or EDPC. Following North Korea's second nuclear test and launching of the Unha-2 long-range rocket, um, the alliance was shared a concern that there was greater risk of alliance decoupling and of a stability-instability paradox on the peninsula. As a matter of global nuclear posture, the Obama administration sought to strengthen regional deterrence architectures and bolster alliance cooperation, while the Im myung bak administration sought to make the U.S. pledge of extended nuclear deterrence, quote and unquote, more concrete. For South Korea, there was a perception that U.S. declaratory, declaratory policy commitment was insufficient. This was informed partly by the failure of the alliance to deter North Korea's sinking of the Chanan and the shelling of Waipido. Acts of aggression understood as likely to continue amid a North Korean leadership transition and increasingly credible nuclear shadow. 
Further, there was a rock desire to better understand U.S., but in particular, POTUS's intent regarding the nuclear umbrella, given President Obama's pledge globally to reduce the role of nuclear weapons. This, of course, occurring amid an increase in North, in North Korea's threat on the peninsula. Finally, the South Korea desired uh, better understanding of U.S. nuclear operations, planning and execution, which remained opaque despite South Korea's vital national security interests depending on them. The EDPC thereby provided a mechanism for the United States and South Korea to exchange views on the North Korea threat and design a more comprehensive collective approach to deterrence. Through joint studies and tabletop exercises, uh, the EDPC established the alliance's tailored deterrence strategy, a bilateral agreement to leverage not only the U.S. nuclear umbrella, but also the conventional strike and missile defense capabilities, and not only U.S. assets, but also rock capabilities. In parallel, the alliance had another consultative mechanism, the Counter-Missile Capabilities Committee. Here, uh, the committee established the 4D strategy, which was a comprehensive alliance approach to counter missile operations. The 4D strategy was a bilateral agreement to counter North Korea's missile, get, missile threat through not only deterrence by punishment, but also deterrence by denial, coordinating U.S. and ROC plans to develop missile defense systems. This was followed in 2015 by the merger of the EDPC and the CMCC to create the Deterrence Strategy Committee, the DSC, which remains today. The focus on deterrence instead of extended deterrence in the name of this committee was deliberate. It was meant to underscore an alliance deterrence posture that integrated rock capabilities to complement the U.S. nuclear umbrella. Further, it acknowledged advances in North Korea's threat to marry nuclear capabilities with missile capabilities. The body of the DSC ended up continu continuing policy dialogues it's exchanging thoughts on the North Korean threat, continuing TTXs, and conducting site visits to make the U.S. capacity to extend nuclear deterrence, quote unquote, more tangible. This, of course, was followed in 2016 by the DSC agreement uh, on the 40 Concepts and Principles Implementation Guidelines, or the CPIC. Here, I'd like to just point out that for South Korea, it was extremely important to reach an agreement on implementation guidelines, right? Here the key word being implementation. Also in that year, the Alliance established what's now referred to as the Extended Deterrence Strategy and Consultation Group, the EDSCG. This raid raised the level of bilateral consultations of the DSC, which was at the DASD level, to the ASD level, and it also included a two plus two format. So co-chairs from both defense and state with their rock counterparts. Now this form, this new architecture of consultative mechanisms recognized that deterrence relied on diplomacy and economic statecraft just as much as it did military means. Of course, politics um, came into play and during the Moon administration and the Trump administration, the EDSCG was paused. But with President Biden and President Yoon coming into office, it was reactivated in 2022, with all of its activities again coming into play. Ultimately, what this history shows is that the Alliance has made critical progress in realizing a more comprehensive approach to deterrence, in advancing their extended nuclear deterrence consultations, and in establishing policy framework to guide more effective deterrence operations. However, this has yet to overcome a policy operations gap. Integrating South Korea and U.S. nuclear operations in a way that makes the U.S. nuclear umbrella more concrete or addresses, or addresses the enduring perceptions of the need to better implement, or in Korean, shiheng, or operationalize, unyong, deterrence, themes of this UN administration. As I take a step back, you know, I recognize the genuine intent of the Biden administration to strengthen extended deterrence. There have been a lot of activities since the Yoon uh, Biden administration have made efforts and agreed to do so. But if you look at this history, 
of consultative mechanisms. What you realize is that our two administrations, unfortunately, are just doing more of the same. And I do not believe that this addresses the enduring challenge of the gaps of tasks that the Alliance needs to address in order to be more fit for purpose, to be more relevant, to actually enhance deterrent effects, uh, to bolster up the credibility of the US nuclear umbrella, um, and ultimately posture the Alliance for the future, for the next 70 years in this very tenuous security environment. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate further on policy recommendations on how to do this, how I view the need to reform consultative mechanisms and alliance activities, um, but to, I, I will reserve those comments for the Q&A. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. So in my piece, um, I want to draw a bit of focus on South Korea's drive towards deterrent capabilities, but I want to characterize this um, as a uh, story of limits, um, namely technical limits and political limits. Um, you can call them hurdles, you can call them tasks, you can call them whatever you want, but in, essentially these are limits that entail spoiling factors um, that have prevented the ROK from going nuclear and continue to do so. Uh, I want to characterize the 1970s as a time of South Korea confronting very stark technical limits, but facing comparatively fewer political constraints. Um, when Park Chung-hee directs the Agency for Defense Development, the ADD, to develop this indigenous nuclear deterrent um, to provide this uh, asymmetric um, deterrent capability against then superior conventional forces from Pyongyang, um, a lot of technology had to skirt U.S. restrictions. Um, South Korea did have nuclear power plants at that time with U.S. support, uh, but to build a weapon, South Korea would need to enrich enough fissile material. Um, but, of course, the question being how to do that without the U.S. knowing. Um, and so how do you build reactors that would not fall under U.S. inspection or supervision and learn key reprocessing technologies without starting from scratch, which they believed would help enrich enough fissile material to accrue them to build this initial 20 kiloton device. Um, as it would happen, South Korea would end up reaching out to other countries like France and Canada uh, to acquire key spent fuel reprocessing technologies um, that they, would, they had hoped would uh, move this project forward. And of course, thanks to the hard work of some, it ended up failing. Um, <laughs> But in some ways, there were fewer political constraints at the time. Um, on the international normative side, uh, the NPT was still nascent. Uh, in a rather ironic episode, the NPT was, it could be seen as being used by the ROK when South Korea ratified the NPT in 1975 as a precondition to acquire Canadian heavy water reactors, which they hoped to violate the NPT with. Um, other institutions like the Nuclear Suppliers Group, NSG, was emerging. It would be founded in 1974. And of course, domestically, like Dr. Work mentioned, the presidency was a far more powerful institution. Uh, and public opinion had a far weaker influence. If Park told ADD and the Korean Atomic Energy Research Institute, the Kairi, to build nukes, they were going to build nukes. Um, and it ended up taking tremendous effort from the United States to put a stop to South Korean proliferation in the 1970s, which my colleagues in the panel have covered and will cover in greater detail. Whereas today, I'd say not all, but many technical limits have been overcome to a degree. But I believe political limits pose major obstacles that present the still big gap between nuclear latency and actual nuclear capability. Briefly touching on the warhead aspect, um, South Korean technical prowess in nuclear technology have come a long way. Um, there are still, again, some technical limits, but I believe what are most stringent are political limits and consequences. Uh, we saw a glimpse from the overwhelming response over a small test in refining uranium by some scientists in 2000, which were not related to the ROK government. Um, when it was discovered, it was immediately disavowed by the South Korean government, and it triggered an immediate investigation by the IAEA, 
So mechanisms were immediately activated, and in kind, uh, they were immediately and actively responded to. And it's very important to recognize that this architecture still exists today. As for latency in delivery capabilities, I use the term latent triad, and I know the word triad raises questions and eyebrows. Um, let's first start with a disclaimer. South Korea is not currently developing a nuclear deterrent. Its conventional capabilities are not being built with the intent of building out a nuclear architecture. And any suggestions to that effect are both disavowed by myself and would be fiercely pushed back by the South Korean government. South Korea's indigenous aircraft and air launched ordnance development, ballistic missile development, subsurface capability developments are built out of conventional deterrence goals um, and are well within alliance architectures. But I use the term latent triad because if South Korea chooses to go nuclear, South Korea would not be starting from scratch to build out capabilities to deliver a payload at range from the air, land, and sea. So the technical latency in terms of having a potential triad is there. So why not full speed ahead with building out this nuclear architecture, of course, the first warhead aspect aside? I would argue that there are still political limits with which Seoul has kept in close accordance. For example, the South Korean ballistic missile range limits were extended in lockstep with alliance consultation. Not once did South Korea blatantly violate um, these limits that were set in agreement with the United States. Lastly, there are political limits in developing a working nuclear doctrine in that what would normally constitute a doctrine does not yet exist. Um, and I argue this is a political limitation, a limitation as in there are policy questions that have yet to be addressed but need to be surmounted if the intent is to boost latency and close the gap with actual capability. So one area that one could look at is civil defense. Um, that's an area where we're not seeing that much discussion on preparing the civilian population for a post-use environment. Um, are there enough gas masks and iodine pills? Are there enough hardened bunkers and shelters and shelf-stable supplies? Is there a policy thrust specifically catered toward a potential post-use environment? I'd say it's lacking at best. And in order to develop an actual working doctrine in terms of having nuclear capabilities, I'd say this is another task that needs to be surmounted, and it's a hurdle that is presented to South Korea closing the gap between latency and capability. But just as this has been a story of limits, it also has been one of those stories of these limits shifting. And Seoul may have certain expectations of how things could change from the status quo, um, which is where the US role also comes in and which will be covered greatly by my colleagues. For example, I, I spoke about how conventional development has occurred within alliance boundaries, like with Korean ballistic missile guidelines, shifting over the decades. It's worth asking if limits have shifted in these areas, could they not also shift elsewhere? And it's understandable in this regard that other US allies appearing to be given greater leeway in boosting its latency could be perceived as unfair by the ROK, resulting in increased demands. So US action and consultation has a lot of weight because after all, South Korea is it's not a rogue country. Um, it's not in Seoul's interest to act completely against the grain of international or alliance norms on its own. So in conclusion, looking at these political considerations and limits uh, shows that even with these polling numbers and increased discourse today, South Korea is not on the precipice of going nuclear just on the basis of its technical latency. The current state of ROK deterrent capability is that conventional deterrence has come a long way. But for nuclear latency to become a capability, there are still gaps in the technical space and even larger ones in the politics and policy space that would require a lot more action. I'll first provide a brief overview of the 1970s ROK nuclear program and draw on some points of comparison and contrast with the ongoing nuclear debate. The 1970s was a turbulent period for the U.S. ROK alliance. The Nixon Doctrine, U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, and the taunt with China exacerbated Seoul's fear of U.S. abandonment. The alliance was further frayed by the Park Chung-yee regime's domestic oppression, which drew criticism from the U.S. Congress. <laughs> 
Park aspired for a deterrent that is independent of the U.S. security guarantee. In the summer of 1974, the CIA station in Seoul reported to Washington that the ROK government is pursuing nuclear weapons. This plan included buying canned reactors from Canada and reprocessing plants from France. Through a mix of security assurances, unilateral pressure, and coordination with Western allies between 1974 and 1976, Washington successfully dissuaded itself from fully developing nuclear weapons. The Park jong il regime canceled the reprocessing contract with France. While South Korean interest in nuclear weapons did persist, the ROK has made no serious effort to pursue them since late 1976. The first point of comparison here is how the U.S. continues to see the issue from a global non-proliferation regime perspective, the fact that this is not a strictly bilateral issue between Washington and Seoul. The non-proliferation treaty came into effect in 1970 with strong U.S. backing. Washington was caught off guard by India's first nuclear weapons test in 1974, and has been keeping close eyes on potential proliferators. Canada, whose reactor sailed to India, inadvertently helped their nuclear program, was intent on not repeating the same mistake with the South Koreans. The Park government's pursuit of nuclear weapons thus came at a very sensitive time when the U.S. and its allies were scrambling to salvage the MPT regime. In 2023, Washington continues to see the issue from a broader non-proliferation agenda. Discussions in Washington surrounding ROK nuclear armament deal with the danger of a nuclear arms race in East Asia. They also debate implications for other regions, such as the Middle East, where Iran's nuclear program is fueling discussions of nuclear armament. The second point of comparison is that of alliance maintenance. In the 1970s, Washington was concerned that a nuclear-armed South Korea could act both independently and assertively against American wishes. For his part, Park faced a paradox. His response to a potential U.S. abandonment was in fact making it more likely. The pressure from the U.S. government was not just economic. Washington threatened Park that the entire relationship is at risk because of the nuclear program. It's important to note here that Park wanted to have it both ways. He believed that should the ROK fully develop nuclear weapons, the U.S. will then have to accept it into the nuclear club. When he realized, however, that he had to choose one, he gave up the nuclear option. <coughs> in 2023, many experts worry that the process of developing nuclear weapons could jeopardize the alliance. In recent years, we have seen some disagreements between the U.S. and South Korea over issues such as um, over China, North Korea, and Japan, and a nuclear-armed South Korea aspiring for strategic autonomy in Washington's eyes could behave like the Gulf's friends after it acquired nuclear weapons in 1960. The third point of comparison is that of alternative security assurance. In the 1970s, there was growing consensus in Washington that Seoul was capable of maintaining reasonable defense against the North, potentially even without American ground troops. The issue, however, was as much about perception as about reality. U.S. Ambassador to Korea, Richard Snyder, noted that South Korea, and I quote him, was suffering the agony of self-doubt. Snyder pointed out that Seoul harbored the siege mentality that psychologically normalized drastic measures such as a secret nuclear program. This sentiment was particularly strong following South Vietnam's collapse in 1975, U.S. openings to the PRC, and North Korean provocations. American efforts to stop Korea from going nuclear therefore included alternative security measures. In 1975, Henry Kissinger, Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, each gave explicit defense commitments to Seoul. And the U.S. government transferred modern aircraft, including the F-4, F-5, and A-37 to the ROK. In 2023, many are puzzled why Seoul is so skeptical of the U.S. extended deterrence. Just as in the 1970s, it is much of our perception. Popular South Korean characterization of Kim Jong-un depict him as erratic, irrational, and reckless. Some in the security establishment fear that Kim Jong-un could gamble on a weakened U.S. security umbrella. There are even specific scenarios for this. North Korea blackmails Washington with ICBMs that can hit the U.S. mainland, eliciting a compromise at the expense of South Korean interests. 
In the 1970s, the support was conventional, and that was enough. Now, when North Korea's own nuclear weapons program, that may not be sufficient. A transformed regional strategic context even further complicates the feasibility of alternative assurances. Providing South Korea with conventional assistance in the 1970s was relatively straightforward, and there are two reasons for this. First, the Sino-Soviet split in the US-China detente meant that China tolerated and even embraced US presence in the region. By the early and mid-1970s, a large-scale direct conflict between the, Chi between the PRC and the Soviet Union was a realistic possibility. China, therefore, welcomed the US as a counterweight to the Soviets. Zhou Enlai also accepted Kissinger's argument that American countries in the region wore bottle caps on potential resurgent Japanese militarism. As Defense Secretary Schlesinger assured Park Chung himself, Beijing viewed U.S. military assets in Asia as Washington's leash on U.S. allies, not a blank check on their, for their adventurism. Secondly, China was unwilling to sponsor North Korea's provocations and was tepid in protecting Pyongyang's security interests. Maoist fanatics during the Cultural Revolution criticized North Korea for being revisionist. Tensions at the China-North Korea border resulted in armed clashes in 1969 and 1970. In 1975, Kim Il-sung visited China to win Beijing's support for an aggressive strategy toward the South, while the U.S. was still grappling with the damage of Vietnam. Mao, however, however declined. With South Korea not strong enough to threaten China directly, and with no ostensible danger of losing North Korea as a buffer state, Beijing held little concern over renewed U.S. security commitments to South Korea. The strategic environment, obviously, however, has now dramatically shifted. The ongoing U.S.-China great power competition translates into Chinese opposition to strengthen the U.S. ROK alliance. North Korea has become very useful for China in its competition with the U.S. China prefers that U.S. military assets and political attention are fixed on North Korea, which might otherwise be deployed directly against China. Deterioration in broader U.S.-China rela US relations over Taiwan and the South China Sea could lead China into encouraging North Korean aggression against the South. The broader context in play in the 1970s was this implicit understanding of great power responsibility. The 1970s nuclear issue was resolved because both the U.S. and China were willing to restrain their Korean clients. Washington risked a major risk in the alliance to pressure Seoul into giving up nuclear weapons. And Beijing, on the other hand, um, at the same time, tolerated alternative US security assurance to South Korea, and this, this allowed Kim Il-sung from pressuring Seoul too much. In the so-called new Cold War between the US and China, however, both Washington and Beijing firmly believe that the other side is derelict of its great power duty to rein in aggressive allies. China has little interest in pushing North Korea for denuclearization. Beijing, on its part, they argue that Washington is pressuring U.S. allies into encircling China. I want to end on, on the note that the broader regional strategic context will influence the nuclear debate in South Korea. The Vietnam War propelled ROK's nuclear aspirations in the 1970s. Similarly, failure to fend off North Korean aggression or prevent Chinese revisionism in the region would radically dial up the nuclear debate in South Korea in 2023. Thank you. Gentlemen, appreciate it all. Um, I do have a few questions to, to lay on the table. I've got, uh, what, Clint, 10 minutes to do this? 10, 10, 15. 10, 15. Okay, let me start with you, um, if I may. Sure. Um, there is, um, I think you were, one of the things you've done is in tracing the history of the alliance, you make a really good case that there has been huge unpredictability on both sides in terms of polit the political context, administrative decisions, whether that be on the U.S. side with, uh, for example, the transition into the Carter administration on the ROK side in the transition from a progressive leadership to perhaps a more conservative leadership. And we've seen this um, double sign curve, if you will, always in operation. But somehow the alliance prevailed. 
And I'm wondering if uh, you could look out a bit based on what you've looked at this alliance dynamic and how the alliance did survive um, and bring us to where we are today to any projections you might have as to the alliance's sustainability in a continuing sign curve situation in the future. Sure, so predict the future then. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, the U.S.-South Korea alliance is a historical creation, and for any mm -hmm. historical creation, it has a birth, it has an evolution, and it ultimately has a dissolution and uh, dissipation, or I guess in the case of an individual, a death. Um, that is not what I am predicting. Um, but I do think, just to turn back again before I think about the future, when we, when we, the history we've talked about, um, the nature of the strategic environment and the patron-client-like co aspect of the alliance in previous decades um, gave, obviously, the U.S. a profound uh, influence. I won't say control, because I think that's overstating it, but profound influence over um, how the alliance evolved. Um, of course, they had to respond to South Korean actions, um, again, that they couldn't control, but I think the, the shared interests and shared perceptions of an external threat had a, a continually reconstituted and reaffined effect. And as a result of that, and South Korea's own developments, and Richard, you know this because you were part of this process, the alliance actually deepened and became more institutionalized. The more they encountered difficulties in how they, in sort of disparate views of, of uh, the environment, the more they adjudicated those together and actually created institutional structures or deepened existing ones that, um, helped, helped uh, navigate the double sine curve sort of undulations that the alliance, uh, because of its basic features, has continued to experience. Um, moving forward, and this is sort of building on what I said, um, I do think, uh, I do think the existing institutional underpinnings of the alliance are facing greater pressures today than they did even in the 1970s. Um, it may be the case that the external threat environment is so compelling a forcing factor that it would mitigate against any um, dissolution of the alliance. Um, you know, I, I sort of IR theory might, it, it, especially since it's based on an existing uh, uh, structure. Um, I do think, though, taking into consideration um, political realities that, you know, that I, I touched on and that, that Paul mentioned, that no matter how institutionalized things are, um, I think I think the alliance could be in trouble. Um, uh, you know, and I hate to say that in this 70th year anniversary, its virtues should rightly be extolled. Um, but I think business as usual is not going to cut it. Right. So if that's what we try to do, that's going to be very, prob very problematic for the sustainability of the alliance. Um, but that doesn't mean that's what's going to happen. Right. Um, I've been long-winded, so I'll, I'll okay. stop with that. Well, that's sort of a segue and uh, something I'm going to pose to Paul. By the way, I totally agree with your final concluding comment, your assessment. Uh, and I think it was very useful that you took us through the entire EDSG process and where we are today. Um, and I think um, that in itself is a very useful paper for people to read that are policymakers to understand how we got to that point. Um, when I was in the Pentagon and we were doing in the, in the uh, let's say, 2002, 2008 period, and we were trying to manage the alliance better through something called FOTA, Future of the Alliance, we actually laid a list on the table of 15 things that the Koreans, the Republic of Korea, was not doing mission capability-wise, and we expected them to step up over a fairly short period, fund, do them all, bring the capabilities in. They were all reasonable requests. But to your point, uh, every aspect of this was uh, seen as us attempting to transfer to them the responsibility to do what we had always done before. Mm 
lot of it was little stuff. Some of it was big stuff, but it was all a suggestion, or the Im implication was, we're getting ready to leave. Uh, by making them stronger, we're getting ready to leave. And, and I would say this to you, as you, and I put this to you, as you describe where we are now with the EDSG, you really are saying we haven't, we're incapable of operationalizing it sufficiently to convince our alliance partner that we really mean it. Is that your conclusion? Am I, re am I misstating your conclusion? It's slightly different. I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that I actually believe not that the U.S. is incapable of operationalizing, but it actually has to change the way it operates. So I have the utmost confidence in U.S. capability and capacity. I also, unfortunately, recognize um, the stronghold that legacy and bureaucratic culture has that pushes back against real change. Mm -hmm. And so, You know, you, you noted the future of the alliance talks, right? For me, the future is here now, right? If you look at some of the discussions about future concepts, about future capabilities, it is so urgent. And I do agree with Clint that we are in a crisis. I do believe that we can step up to the challenge, but it requires an acknowledgement that we need to change the way we operate, particularly um, with regard to the United States and its nuclear operation. Thank you. Um, I, I guess continuing maybe in this, I'm gonna jump right to, um, to Andy and um, Good discussion of latent triad. And um, I, I take your point um, that capabilities and intentions have this really nice mix about them. It was something we confronted before, and we're sort of in a situation where we have um, much fewer technical constraints on a very well-developed and sophisticated South Korean nuclear program at large. Uh, but we have some very much stronger, well-defined uh, uh, constraints on the political aspect of it, of that decision. But I think by um, delving into the so-called latent triad and your assessment of Korean current intentions and latent capabilities, what would you project if you're looking out a few years in the future? Because I think this issue is going to be with us really hard over the next decade or so. How would you see that playing out on, the, on both sides of the capabilities, on the, on the technical side, because you've looked at this obviously, and on the political side? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as someone who focuses a lot in KEI along with my colleagues, of course, on the growing South Korean defense industry here, it's, um, we, we look at it, of course, currently within the architecture of the alliance and pursuing conventional deterrence. And of course, there's also a lot of defense economics and, and, and other things that play a role in this. So I think whether or not uh, there's this intention to build the nuclear architecture, which I don't argue that there is at the moment, um, I think a lot of these capabilities will continue to evolve and grow out. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of this, there's still a ways to go in this. And I argue in my paper, I guess, one aspect of it is with regards to nuclear-powered submarines. And, and that's, that's, that's something that South Korea has been asking for a long time. And that's another thing that where they see other US allies get some of the toys that they want and they need. They start thinking, what, a, well, I mean, what about us? Or, or how can these guidelines change and could change how South Korea uh, 
views its defense posture and how, how they could build out this capability. Um, but of course, the broader trends of indigenization and building a lot of their own capabilities to be able to suit their own defense uh, needs, while of course building it into the alliance architecture, I, I think that's gonna continue to play a role in a lot of the technical capabilities they build out. I, I don't know if that answers the question exactly. It, it does, and, and let me just say this, the whole issue of the Korean nuclear submarine, nuclear attack submarine, that dominated a lot of the Moon administration, and they used it politically, and they used it as a demand to the United States. We can build to the United States, they would say and did say on a regular basis at every level, including the presidential level, we can build that nuclear submarine ourselves. All we need for you to do is give us the nuclear fuel elements we need in our reactor. So that's all you have to do. And of course, that created a policy dilemma for us if we begin giving that component of a nuclear reactor to even an ally, where does it stop? So here you had a manufactured political, um, how shall I say, incident that had real mileage, at least in the minds of the Moon administration. The U.S. could not compromise on that, would not compromise. So in terms of a latent capability that you're arguing, we had a latent capability in the Republic of Korea to build a nuclear submarine, and here the United States constrained, ostensibly, their ability to do it. So I think there's going to be situations like this, per your presentation, in the future that we're going to have to face. So that's why I think it's very valuable that you're talking about latent capabilities, latent political structures. Andy, do I, excuse me, do I have time, Clint, for one more question here? Uh, you do. Um, okay. Yes, uh, you do. Okay, Tewa, um, on your presentation, what I found interesting was um, that you brought up the fact that it just so happened in the 70s that we had the Indian uh, detonation at the very time that others were moving very quickly, including the Republic of Korea, to put in place all the things they thought they needed to have a program. And, and we had a situation where our nuclear proliferation awareness and regime was attempting to run to catch up to a moving car. In other words, we'd missed uh, the train and we were running after it trying to jump on board. And it was uh, very fortuitous um, if for the, our international proliferation regime, in a way that we were facing uh, a Taiwan situation and an ROK situation that we had no choice but to deal with, and I think that forced the issue for everything. So I think your commentary on this is, if you were to put your hand on one lesson learned from that experience, what would it be in the 70s? Um, from the broader MPT regime yeah, yeah. perspective? Mm, the fact that um, not only the US, but especially European partners, European allies in the, of the US will have a say in the debate. Um, if you look at the process of negotiation between ROK in the 1970s and to their interlocutors in France and Canada, we see in intense discussions amongst those Western allies, um, meetings between US, Canadian, and French officials in order to make sure that South Korea does not get the reprocessing capability. Um, sometimes um, when we talk about the ongoing nuclear debate right now, it tends to look a little bit narrowly between the U.S. and South Korea themselves, just the two of them. Um, I think it's important to note that um, a lot of countries will have a say on this, not just the two of those. Well, good. We're going to throw it open, I believe, to uh, questions for from the audience. Uh, take your shots. And uh, yes, sir. Uh, one question I have is about what is, the, we haven't talked, with the future is now, one of the main things going on right now that we haven't, the United States hasn't confronted since 1945 is a major war in Europe. What is the bandwidth of any administration to deal with that, plus China, which you've also mentioned? I mean, it's, I mean, Ukraine is a small country, but 
so is the Republic of Korea. And so how much uh, bandwidth does the U.S. government have to, uh, to deal with the urgent questions that you mentioned? Can I just, just quickly, I know I'm sure Paul and others will have responses. So I, in my paper, I, I allude to Europe, and of course I'm, I'm talking about Ukraine. Um, this light is killing me. Um, this, this is what makes the trends we're talking about that much more urgent, is there are questions about what assets the U.S. can bring to bear and the timeliness with which they can do them, given the demands in Europe and, God forbid, a situation in the Taiwan Strait. Um, when you examine potential scenarios where there are crises in Taiwan and potentially something burbling in Korea, it's often the questions are raised about the U.S. needing to draw assets and forces from the Korean Peninsula to address issues elsewhere, um, and even asking for uh, for rock assistance in this. And this all puts greater stress on what we're what we're talking about, which is the fact that we have, as the South Koreans always have, uh, their threat right across the border, which is more urgent than ever. Um, and so. I, what I'm interested in is how, you know, when we talk about potential OPCON transfer, if the, if, the, if the South Koreans are going to take a greater role in their own defense, which I think, given the current context, we have to explore um, moving that forward and what that looks like. Um, it's not to say they're going it alone, but because of the bandwidth, I think the U.S. government can, can chew gum and walk at the same time. But at the end of the day, there are, there are limits to capacity. And if you're dealing with multiple crises at once, um, you have to spread resources accordingly. And to me, this just puts, this, this highlights exactly the, the dilemma that South Korea is facing. And given current tread lines, again, not to be overly negative, I think these questions of constraints and where the ROC needs to step up and be more of a lead um, are becoming even more prominent questions. And I think Ukraine highlights that. Let me make a brief comment. Um, I think it's a very important question. And um, I think we have to be mindful that ever present in South Korean planners' minds uh, is the fact that it looks like there is a real possibility of a serious contingency vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, China-Taiwan. In such an event, uh, the United States, as Clint mentioned, is probably going to flow forces or have to be flow forces off the peninsula. But even if they don't flow forces off the peninsula, they certainly wouldn't have the capability to reinforce the Korean peninsula to uh, match a major North Korean provocation. So I think uh, the concern here is if we do have a Taiwan contingency or near war scenario, U.S. forces are going to flow and there is this vulnerability that the Koreans and we sense that this is a beautiful time for the North Koreans to provocate, and probably provocate in a series of actions, not just one-offs, to destabilize the South Korean government. So I think um, it's, a, it's a very valid concern. And I don't know that, you know, I'm not doing it anymore, but I don't know if we've war-gamed sufficiently uh, such, a such a scenario that draws those forces away. My last point is one has to remember that um, when, the, when Kim Il-sung started the Korean War, he ra basically robbed Mao and Communist China of the ability to invade Taiwan. They were supposed to invade post-typhoon season in about a October, November period in 1950. And they were prepared to do so uh, until um, the war was uh, launched in um, Korea. So in a way, in the Chinese mindset, um, the North Koreans, in a way, uh, allowed Taiwan to continue to exist. So there is that dynamic among the, the, the players here that we have to recognize. But I, I do agree with the question that you posed. Richard, could we, could we uh, in truly hybrid fashion, take one of the online questions? I'm sorry. No, no, that's OK. Um, uh, Jeffrey Robinson. Ah. OK. With, do, I, do I read it, or? Yeah, uh, yes, please. Yes, of course I do. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what we're talking about. Um, with uh, historical focus, panelists looked at strategy, for example, alliance and North Korean issues. But the current debate also concerns domestic politics. I assume that means both Korean and American. 
will inform debate highlighting strategic cost dampen the current push? Yes. So I, I think the, the person who posed the question implied the, the punitive cost that the United States or the rest of the world might place on Korea if it went nuclear. I would counter and say that there are also costs if the security environment deteriorates and the U.S. nuclear umbrella lacks credibility for South Korea not to go nuclear. Yes. And, and that's the existential threat that we face. The fact that people in Washington are debating this based on my president's statement that he would consider this option, I think, <laughs> is a bit detached from the reality in which South Korea lives. Um, so, and I would advise that as we look back on history and that kind of pressure campaign to encourage South Korea not to go nuclear should not be the lesson to be learned in today's South Korean democracy. Yes where there are concerns about U.S. bandwidth, where we are a true strategic partner, where we do face a nuclear threat and live in an environment where, where North Korea, China, and Russia are all nuclear, uh, that this cost imposition approach to discouraging South Korea from going nuclear is not the way to go at alliance management, and in fact, the better approach is to welcome this discussion and have an honest debate about what nuclear weapons can and cannot do and whether or not they are the appropriate option or whether or not we do need to just reform the way the U.S. operates its nuclear umbrella. Paul just gave the reason why we organized this conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there's a, a, an overlaying comment, if I may, Paul. You could take the word South Korea out of that statement that you just made and splice in the word Japan. Uh, the same issues relate to Japan. And what this is a, the, the purpose of this discussion is not to talk about what the regional knock-on effects are, but there's one thing for sure. If South Korea, for reasonable reasons, found it necessary to do what we're talking about, the Japanese would be there the week next. And so we, we have to appreciate all that dynamic. So, and I would like to play that scenario out, right? So South Korea goes nuclear and the U.S. Uh, you know, does away with the alliance with South Korea. Then Japan goes nuclear, and so what? The U.S. is going to do away with its alliance with Japan? And then all of a sudden, what's your alliance posture or look like in the Indo-Pacific? I, you know, let's play that out realistically, and I just do not see that happening. Okay, I agree, yeah. Gentleman in the back in the red sweater. Uh, Stanley Kober. I am looking at an editorial in Chosen Ilbo, just published. Quote, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act has cast a dark cloud yes. over Korea's exports. The title behind you, Alliance for the Future. What kind of an alliance is this if we are undercutting the Korean economy with this sort of a measure? This is the Korea Economic Institute. We can talk about alliance. We can talk about nuclear guarantee. But doesn't this get to the heart of what an alliance is? I'll answer very quickly because I had a very recent conversation with a very senior Korean, South Korean official. And, um, you know, the problem always is we make policy decisions and then we figure out about two or three weeks later we should tell our allies. Uh, so the issue of surprise is number one because they are then left to figure out what the hell we've done and what the impact is on them. Um, but these are real body blows uh, to uh, the bilateral relationship. And in fact, there's been several of these issues in recent uh, weeks. And so um, from the standpoint of uh, the Korean Economic Institute and the economic, uh, strategic economic relationship between the two countries, I think it just adds to uh, what I'll call uh, strategic uncertainty. So I'm um, taking your point. 
I, just, I mean, I, I agree with everything Richard just said. It's interesting because when you look at um, the language around the U.S.-South Korea alliance being a comprehensive strategic alliance and now a global comprehensive strategic alliance, it's, it's the traditional security relationship, it's the economic ties, it's the people-to-people -people ties. These are the layered reasons that this is such a strong alliance and partnership, and that's all true as far as it goes. We're now in an environment, though, where economic issues and policy and national security are becoming profoundly intertwined in complicated ways. So it's what was a strength is now becoming, I'm not going to say a weakness, but, but a window through which these layered elements of the alliance are becoming problematically sort of clashing at times. And so when I talk about the broader political context, it's also this, uh, this economic side of things. I mean, we, we're talking about economic security, but I don't know if there are shared definitions of what that means and what one ally does to bolster that um, is clearly not in the interest of the other. And then this just, it, it casts the, the shadow of doubt beyond all the urgent security issues we're, we're, we're discussing. So they're, they, they are intertwined. And so I think it makes all this even more problematic. I'm sound awfully negative right now, but um, I, it's a fair question. But sometimes, you know, like Clint says, it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, and here we have uh, a conservative administration, a, a president that is determined to reach out and try to yeah. deepen the relationship, however that's done, and then you announce something that is really domestically, politically, a body blow to him, which was the recent uh, regulations that were announced that essentially excluded Republic of Korea on the, um, on the um, electric car and battery, the EV issue, but included Mexico and Canada. And so you have terrific domestic embarrassment, and so that makes it more difficult, I think, for a erstwhile president to execute a more pro-engagement strategy when he's undercut politically uh, by the United States. So we just don't think these things through ahead of time, I think, in an alliance context. Yes, sir. So, Paul, you in your presentation said you would be happy to sort of give your ideas. And I want to give you an opportunity, but I also want to put it in context because, you know, we look at this debate, one of the things that comes to mind for me, and perhaps I've missed it in the news and everything, but is if there was any country that I think would be driving for a nuclear weapon right now, it would be Poland. Um, you know, you have the war in Ukraine. You have legitimate Russian threats of using nuclear weapons. Clearly, there's a lot of history there involved in everything as well. Now, I understand that the NATO nuclear the version of nuclear umbrella with NATO is different than the one in Korea and Japan, and so maybe that will get to some of your comments. But I guess so I'd like to sort of say like what you think we should be doing and then in that context of perhaps why maybe we're not seeing this debate in Europe as opposed to seeing it, you know, in Korea and sort of what other factors really because I guess what I'm trying to get at is is at the end of the day, is this that Korea wants a nuclear weapon and the context doesn't matter? Or is this that there are factors that are really are unique to the Korean Peninsula that perhaps aren't getting highlighted enough? So my comment in, in tracking consultative mechanisms really focused on um, the work of policymakers, right? And I think that's important because a lot of the opinion polls are not discerning between the Korean public and those in government. And as many people in this room probably know better than I, those in the South Korean government today are not having this debate on nuclear armament. They are exerting all their energies on two lines of effort. One is really realizing a South Korean non-nuclear strategic deterrent and how to strengthen U.S. nuclear umbrella. I think that this is where there's huge alignment between the Biden administration and Yoon administration. But there needs to be changes on both sides of the equation. Specifically, we really need to talk as an alliance on conventional nuclear integration and what the appropriate balance is with regard to um, how we equip, train, prepare our forces. Right. To raise the credibility 
of the U.S. nuclear umbrella, you need to prepare the ground forces for U.S. nuclear use. Right? Despite the U.S. fielding low-yield nuclear weapons and making changes during the Trump administration that filled certain capability gaps, I have yet to see in the South Korean budget or South Korean forces or even the combined forces, USFK, changes in their budget to operate in a post-US use. So for me, that is a huge uh, sign, signal, that we could be addressing today without even moving closer to South Korean nuclear armament. The, the other is we actually have the, the KID, the Korean Integrated Defense Dialogue. And that, and the DSC and all this nuclear extended terms is tucked into that. And that is supposed to be the ultimate alliance integrator to talk about both conventional and nuclear. But what it really is, is a stapler, right? It takes the very stovepiped work of two different committees and just basically puts it all together, right? It, it's not integrated by design from the beginning. And unless we, we address that, we're not gonna be able to, um, to make progress. The, the last thing I'll say is, you know, there was talk about uh, nuclear propulsion submarine technology, right? I think the, the key way forward in the next two, three years right now is actually AUKUS Pillar 2, mm -hmm. right? Um, quantum sensing, emerging capabilities, that really try to show South Korea whether or not we need nuclear weapons, right? And that is something that the Biden administration needs to double down on South Korea if it wants to extend the life of nonproliferation, uh, boost up the credibility, and just strengthen deterrence writ large. Gentleman on the end, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> if uh, Russia were to come out on top in its, its Ukraine conflict, it's likely to lead to a more multipolar world. What impact might that have on the U.S.-Korea alliance? I mean, the first question I would have is, w what does it look like it coming out on coming out on top? What what does that scenario look like? Uh, they retain those uh, four provinces or oblasts in, in uh, uh, Ukraine. Ukraine gives up with the intention to join NATO, and and they sue for peace and and yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. it, it accelerates the trend that we've already been talking about, yeah, yeah. right? It places greater pressure and demands on the U.S. global posture in Europe, which heightens concerns in South Korea about what the U.S. is able to deliver. And brings to the fore, is the U.S. ready to, you know, build partner capacity, help South Korea take on greater responsibility for local and Indo-Pacific so that we as an alliance, as a coalition, a greater coalition of like-minded countries can address this multipolarity. I, I just want to add one, it, it also refracts back domestically. I mean, we already have prominent political figures in our country questioning how we're supporting Ukraine as is. And so it, I agree with Paul, it, it increases the need for the U.S. to, uh, the burden for, for the U.S. and Europe, but it also raises further questions that are already being asked about why are we doing this, what is the sustainability of this, and then I think what happens is all U.S. commitments get conflated together in ways where people raise questions about them. What's different between Ukraine and Korea? I mean, I, I understand the differences, but uh, politically speaking, I think those sorts of questions and pressures begin to enter the electoral realm even more uh, severely than they already have. Yeah, and, I, and I think, to your colleague's comment, um, whether we want to, um, whether we don't have boots on the ground there or not, the world is looking, and certainly the Koreans look uh, 
at the fact that we have signed up with Ukraine for this conflict. And I think if uh, it's a lost cause, I cannot imagine uh, Poland either demanding that they be included in the current uh, nuclear sharing agreement that Germany uh, st has under NATO, or um, would draw the conclusion that they have no choice as a sovereign nation to themselves go nuclear. I, I, I just see that uh, there's a knock-on effect, and I think if that happens, other countries in the world are going to continue to um, be concerned about the U.S. commitment, and uh, it may well be part of a Korean decision package, at least mentally, unless you guys disagree. <laughs> I, I think you nailed it on the head there, because just as it's a perception issue that Hewa mentioned, I think it could also be read in, in Korea as a perception that the U.S. would be, um, that whatever decisions that U.S. makes on uh, Eastern Europe could also then be applied to Korea. Of course, in the 1970s, that felt a lot closer to home with uh, the withdrawal from the Vietnam War, and of course the withdrawal from uh, the U.S. Seventh Division from South Korea, and they saw they read it as a larger picture. And of course, we can clearly see how perceptions can easily feed into greater policy decisions. We're, we are right up against time. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for uh, for moderating, uh, Richard. Thank and you. we'll go right into our second panel. Right. Thank you so much.